Okay, hi guys, welcome to Crafts and Crimes. That sounded manic, I didn't mean that to sound manic. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the pan murder. And I sketched out these, so there's like a girl and she has a hatchet behind her and then there's a girl in the middle. And then I don't know what is leaning on that wall, but I tried to make it like this androgynous character with a hood, but I don't know, it looks kind of alienish. So I'm going to try to add some acrylics. This paper is, uh, what's it called? Um, Posca paper? No. What are those uh, alcohol ink things called? I'm looking at my cat, Bill Bailey, when I say that. I forget what they're called. Those those markers with alcohol. Anyway, if I think of it, I'll tell you. Anyway, that's the kind of paper it is. So it doesn't, it doesn't soak up any of the material you use or any of the paint that you use. So the acrylic is just going to sit on top of... The paper so I just wanted to see what it would be like to paint on it because I'm wild and crazy that way so let's talk about the pan last name pan uh, so um, mama pan her name looks like it should be pronounced bitch ha huh? which is so <coughs> disrespectful because it's pronounced bic um, and and she's a lovely woman and her husband's name is han pan which also kind of a funny name but they're they're Vietnamese immigrants to Canada, and they had the Canadian dream, so to speak. So, Han was born and educated in Han Pan, the dad, in Vietnam, and he moved to Canada in 1979. And Bic, she immigrated as a refugee, and they were married in Toronto, and they had two children, Jennifer in 1986 and Felix in 1989. Uh, they both found work at a place called Magna International, and it made auto parts. And they were very successful, so uh, they made car parts, basically. The couple, uh, they persistently worked for their money, so they had an extremely strong work ethic, and they, they brought themselves up to a level, I would say based on what I've studied, and, and by that I mean articles I read this evening, to upper middle class. And they had two children, and their children were just as successful as they were, um, they were thrifty, so they were stable enough to purchase a beautiful house with a two-car garage in a nice place in Markham, Ontario. So there was a large population in Markham at that time, and maybe there still is, but that was why they ended up in Markham. So um, Bic, the mom, and Han, the dad, and I'm repeating that because I got confused as I was reading, just so you know who I'm talking about. They had goals, you know, like a like it's stereotypical, but a lot of Asian parents wanted um, their children to do wonderful, which is not a bad stereotype to have about your culture. And uh, so they were doing wonderful. Um, the daughter, Jennifer, she took piano lessons starting at age four and figure skating. And most days of the week, she did both piano and figure skating. And she actually had hopes of Olympic figure skating uh, until she damaged her knee. She went to a uh, secondary school where she played the flute and she was never allowed to date or anything like that because in that culture it's, you know, you don't do that while you're getting your education, which is probably wonderful advice. And um, she wasn't allowed to go to the prom, so basically she spent most of the time studying, which led her to um, have high academic achievements and attend college so her her parents said she'd never gone to a club or been drunk and, and she'd never gone off on her own and she's just always been um, spending time with her parents and studying so she had good grades and she went on to university just like her father uh, and mother wanted her to and she she was gonna be a doctor but she talked to her parents about having a weak uh, stomach and decided on pharmacy school and got into a really great school of pharmacy and graduated from there, I think, with high honors. Oh, at the University of Toronto. Okay, so let's keep on moving. A brother was equally successful in lots of ways. One evening, and I'm going to tell you this by memory because and so that's how I'm going to do it. One evening... Um, as the family was sleeping, the brother, Jennifer, I mean, yeah, the brother, Jennifer, and Han and Bic, uh, there was a home invasion. And 
two men came inside and they ransacked the house. They went upstairs. I think the brother was away, actually. The brother was away at school. He, yeah, he wasn't present at that time. And they ransacked the house, destroyed a lot of things, stole a lot of things. But they actually found Jennifer in her bedroom and they tied her up with a shoelace, a black shoelace, to the banister of her second floor of her home. And after they did that, or maybe just before, because I suppose they might be just before, they went into the parents' bedroom and threatened them with guns, threw a sheet over their heads, and shot them both in the head. So, presuming they were dead, went out, threatened Jennifer while she was tied up, and left the house with the things they had stolen. So, Jennifer, like most teenagers, even though it was not quite iPhone days, I think it was the year 2000, um, had a flip phone in the waistband of her pants. And in the waistband, like a lot of people will put, if you don't have a pocket, will put your phone in the waistband. So you can completely imagine like a teenage girl having that. And because her hands were tied behind her back to the banister, she was able to use her hands to get the flip phone, opened up, dial 911, and she kind of positioned it to the side of herself. And when the op she put the volume all the way up, and when the operator answered, she screamed, you know, I need help, someone in my house, and and you can check out the 911 call if you're dark like that. And you can hear her saying, I need help. There's someone in my house. And then all of a sudden you hear in the background someone screaming. And she's and she she's assuming her parents are dead because she heard all these gunshots. And she can hear someone screaming and she recognizes the voice of her dad. And she says, Dad, I'm okay. Dad, I'm okay. As she's talking to the 911 operator. And the dad screams and doesn't come towards her. I guess runs in another direction. And uh, the 911 operator sends the police over. Okay, so obviously the dad survived his shot to the head, and Bick, the mother, did not. So let's fast forward a little bit. Police are investigating uh, what happened, and Jennifer tells her story. And it turns out, if you didn't already know this, um, that there was uh, some holes in the store. So Jennifer's parents set goals for her that were extremely high. And I think you know where I'm going with this. And she was made to take those piano lessons in figure skating and not allowed to see boys, etc. And they would have been known as tiger parents, which is kind of a common thing for Asian parents. Um, tiger parents are just parents that, you know, only want the best and accept nothing less. So we know about Jennifer leading up to this incident when they looked into her history that she was doctoring her home reports or report cards and she was really an average student somewhere in the 70 range but she made sure and you could do that prior to your home reports coming home on the computer. Um, she was doctoring them to give her straight A's when she had not. Um, she actually doctored her early admission to Ryerson University a letter and she doctored up an acceptance to the University of Toronto. So in truth, she had not graduated high school and had not been accepted into the School of Pharmacy or any schools. Instead, during this time when she had her parents believe she was completing her pharmacy degree, all four years of it, she was dating uh, her boyfriend, a known drug dealer. So she was tired um, her boyfriend's uh, last name was Wong. I don't know the first name. So she was 24, and she was still trying to go along with the facade that she had, you know, graduated high school and completed her pharmacy degree. And her parents became very suspicious. So one night, they followed her. And they found her at this boyfriend's house. So her father said... Um, First of all, when she was caught there, she said that she had been gang raped and tried to insist that, you know, she was there, you know, it wasn't her doing to be there. But the truth was, they found out that she had a boyfriend and she had been seizing them all along. Her father said to her, uh, and not in so many words, like, you can never see him again. And if you choose to see him, please wait until I'm dead or something like that. And apparently she did not want to wait. So... In the spring of 2010, 
Actually, this was iPhone time, so I don't know why she had a flip phone. Pan was in contact, so meaning Jennifer, with a man called Andrew Montemayor, a high school friend. And she said he had boasted about robbing people by knife point, And she said she would give him 1500 to kill her father in a parking lot. And it, it later went on that she gave him $200 and he returned it. And then she asked him to kill both her parents and he didn't want to do it. So her and her boyfriend were back in contact after some trouble. And her boyfriend helped her find someone that could actually get the job done, which was a professional hitman. But she needed $10,000. And the way she did it was she told the professional or she told Wong to tell the hitman if both her parents were dead, she would inherit half a million dollars. And then she would be able to pay him the 10000 So they moved on in the plan together. And they decided that there would be a home invasion. And um, she would be a part of it. She would be home and she would be a victim. And I'm sure she was looking for sympathy in that situation. And meanwhile, she's 16. Think She's 16 and she looks like a tiny little 16-year-old high school girl. Uh, so the murder took place at the Pan House in Markham on November 8, 2010. So she unlocked the front door for the intruders, uh, the hitman and his accomplice, and she sent a text either to the hitman or her boyfriend that said VIP access, which was about to say, it's time, it's time to come and, and commit the murders. So and it, they came in the house, they committed the crime as I detailed earlier, and then Jennifer was left tied up with her phone close enough to her that she could make the call. But she never expected her dad to survive. So if her dad did not survive that shot to the head, then who knows what would have gone on. She may have been free and clear of these murders and inherited the money and, and gone on to live with her drug dealer boyfriend. I don't know. So the very evening of the murder, they thought something was suspicious. They took her in to interview her. Uh, so during her third interview, they started to ask they started to ask her about the phone and how she was able. And you can see video of her interview; it's online. How were you able to get the phone, flip it open, call nine one one? Based on what you told us, your hands were tied at the wrist, and your phone was tucked into your waistband. So anyway, she they asked her to act it out, which she's able to do, but she has to hold the phone so low compared to where she would be speaking that it's almost unreal to think that she could because when you hear the 911 call it's very clear so you can decide anyway so she's still sticking with that um but they feel something isn't right so they put the pressure on as they're trained to do and during her third interview she admitted that she hired the killers but stated she hired them to kill her so which is ridiculous. She want you hire killers to kill you? I don't understand. Like I don't know why where she thought she was going with that story. But in Canada, um, police are allowed to lie to people they're interrogating. So if it if it helps the evidence of the trial, which I always wonder because when I do I watch a lot of crime TV, and when the detectives are saying yeah your buddy gave you up, even if their buddy didn't give them up. I just wondered if that was legal, but apparently it is in Canada. So they use um, half-truths and untruths to help uh, convince her that she's caught. And, and those strategies help. And she's actually, uh, eventually, um, they realize, she, she admits to what she's done. And the names of the hitmen are given out. And the first one, I can't even say his name, Ma Milvikanam. I know my friend Aaron who's listening is probably laughing because I can't say that. Um, shout out to Aaron and Negan and Rich. Milvikanam, Milvikanam, Milvikanam was arrested. And the other one, Carly, was arrested later and they're both, they're both in prison. Um, Wong was arrested herself. Uh, because she was, uh, what do you call it, when someone, imp she was implicated by not only her own words, but the two hitmen. So let's go to the trial. 
I'm just going to take a little break and say I kind of like how the girls are turning out with the acrylics on the um, alcohol ink paper because I still don't have the word I mean. I kind of like how they're turning out. There's a little bit, I'm using a little bit of like the sparkly paint and the girl with the pink dress, it kind of looks a little bit shiny. I like the darks for the back of her hair. I don't know what I'm doing now. The hair was looking fine and now I feel like i got to add a lot of... I never give up. Like, no, that's wrong. I never stop in time. I always overwork everything to hell. Like, I should have just walked away. I should have just added the details for the faces, made them cute, and walked away. But it doesn't matter anyway because that creep over on the left leaning on the wall has ruined this whole picture. I suppose I could cut him out. Not that I'm going to do anything with this picture. I'm just going to turn the page and do another one next time. I don't know. And the wall is, is black. It's like a black wall. He's leaning on. I don't know. Look at his face. I know I don't have his eyes in yet, but his clothes are like all the same color. His hat looks like it's part of his hair. I don't know. He just looks very wrong. All right, let's go to penalties and, and imprisonment. Oh, I'm using Wikipedia and, hold on a second, a site called scmp.com, but I don't know what the scmp stands for. Yeah, those are the two sites I use for resources for this. So she was sentenced to life with no parole. Um, so that's 25 years for the murder of her mother and the attempted murder of her father. So the trial began in 2014 and um, there was so much evidence against her and she just royally screwed it up so bad that um, everybody, I think one of them had a mistrial. I think Carly had a mistrial, um, but ended up receiving 18 years in the long run for conspiracy because if you didn't pull the trigger, I guess, I guess it matters. But I feel like if you're going there with the intent on killing someone, why does it matter who actually pulls the trigger? Whatever. I'm not a lawyer yet. So anyway, she goes to life, 16 years old, and she goes uh, to jail for life, 25 years for the murder of her mother. And how shitty, like, oh God, I hope she felt shitty. She was not able to contact her boyfriend, who also was uh, implicated. So she served her sentence in Kitchener in a women's prison. And I can't even imagine how her father felt. Um, um, the mother, Bic Pan's funeral, was held on November 15, 2010. And I believe it was before her sentencing and all that went down. So she was there with her brother. So uh, it's terrible, but she organized the funeral. And yeah, she was for her mother and she was there with her brother. So I'm not sure how they would have felt about that. The father and brother obviously still surviving. I did read something about him saying that um, that he hoped that she felt something, he said something like more grown up than I would have, but I mean that is his daughter, that he hoped she felt um, sadness for, you know, the way, the, the choice she had made or something like that. And, um, and, and when this case came out, I remember this case coming out, it wasn't that long ago, and I remember people talking about these tiger parents and how some people actually kind of identified with Jennifer and sympathized with her because tiger parents were portrayed in the media as being like almost threatening and abusive to their children in their efforts to make them, you know, amazing athletes or students or both or whatever. And I don't think that's any excuse at all to hire a hitman to kill your parents. So, um, do you notice how when I told you that story, I told you it so that I could throw in that, like, just told you that she was a great student and, you know, and that was a great family, and then I told you that so that you would be shocked? I don't think I did that right, but my whole goal is to make you go, what? 16-year-old daughter did it? What? That's crazy. Anyway, I don't have a lot more to say about it. Um, let me just look at my notes and see if there's anything else you need to know. No, it's the same old stuff on and on. I was, so that's the, that is the really sad murder of Big Pan, attempted murder of 
Pan Pan by their daughter, Jennifer Pan, um, and they were Tiger parents. I have seven minutes left to talk, so guess what? I'm going to. I was going to tell you the story of Rodney Ocala, and maybe I'll just add it for a bonus because I don't find it interesting enough to do a whole story on, so seven minutes should do it. So Rodney Ocala, and I don't even have, this is like completely from, you know what, I better not do this because if I just do it from my memory, I'll fuck it up, but I will just tell you um, a preview in case I ever do do it. He is called the Dating Game Murderer, and he was this, like, to, like right now in 2020, to look at him, you'd think he was, like, weird looking, but maybe in the 70s and 80s he was handsome. He had, he looked like, like, weird long hair, but, like, short but long, like, layered. Like, he'd be the cover of, like, an album that in that decade, one of those decades. And he just looked like a creep. Anyway, maybe he was the epitome of hottie in those decades and he was a real creep and he would go around asking people girls sorry young girls that if he could photograph them because he was a model scout or a talent scout or something like that and he would want them to come and get photographed and just like I'm sure if there if there were more than two people listening there would definitely be somebody who has been asked a female who has been asked by some creep in their teenage years if he could take pictures of them because they could be a model. There is, there, I could throw a rock and hit a woman who has been asked that fucking question. Um, and that's why we fucking need, need to talk about this shit because you need to be warned about these creeps and your daughters need to be warned about these creeps. Um, I have stories from all kinds of people who said, oh yeah, when I was 15 I was walking along the boardwalk and I won't say a name, but I know someone who who went quite far in this scenario, but luckily was freed um, by being smart enough never to go alone with this person, always contacting one of her friends and saying, like, he wants me to go here for this photo shoot, he wants me to go here, and we were always smart, say no, that, no, that's, that's crazy. You know, a real photographer would never do that. A real model scout, talent scout, scout would never do that. So I think whatever reason... I, I knew better when I was younger, probably because my mother was a murderino and like into true crime and shit and super paranoid. But if you didn't know better, you might go and think, wow, this makes me feel really good. He thinks I could be a model. I'm going to go. Maybe I'll be famous. Maybe I'll get money, whatever. So um, after a number of uh, people, women and girls, that he tricked into these models, like photo shoots, I guess, uh, he actually did commit some murders, and I don't have it in front of me, so I don't have the details, and nor do we need to know the details, except that after a number of these murders of women he lured to these fake photo shoots, he went on the newly, no, the dating game, which was like an old, I don't know if it was 70s or 80s, but it looks very 70s, and he went on this game, and he was like the bachelor, and then there was three ladies, the whole thing's awful. The whole idea is so anti-feminist, it's gross. Anyway, there's these three ladies who had to vie for his attention. And the woman that won, won his attention and won a date with him. And yeah, you can Google this, you can see this right on the internet if you want to see his episode of the dating game, Rodney Ocala, the dating game murderer. Uh, she won, and then backstage she went and had a conversation with them. And then she told her her friends and the producers of the show she wanted to decline the date. So she said she knew right away something was wrong. Uh, he was creepy. She does say that he wouldn't make eye contact, but I hate I hate when people um, say that making eye the lack of eye contact is, is a, a attribute of somebody who's creepy or wrong because it's, eye contact is really hard for a lot of people. And that has no bearing on whether someone is a good person or a sociopath. But for whatever reason, that struck her as strange and some other things. And she refused to go on the date with him. So thank God, because she would have been on his victims list. And uh, after that show, he goes on to commit more murders and eventually is caught and convicted. And I can't tell you how much time he spent in prison or if he's even still living today. But I was going to cover that one. 
But sometimes she just gets so tired of talking about how men kill women. So even though I know it's what we need to know because we need to protect ourselves from things like that and we need to know our history and we need to know how to tell our daughters all these ways they can, not that I'm going to scare my kids and tell them in detail like I'm telling you. Um, I'm not an idiot, but I'm not in that sense anyway. But just so that I know where they need to be careful. And there's one right there. Like, do, do your kids know that if some asshole comes up with a camera and says, oh my God, I'm a talent scout or a model scout and you're beautiful. Can you come in to this? I have a studio. Can I, can I take your picture? I mean, that is one of the most common ways for people to try to lure girls and women to be alone with them, which is you should never be alone with someone you don't know ever. It's not safe. And if it doesn't feel safe, it's not safe. So, um, like I always say on this podcast, if, if the hairs on the back of your neck stand up or if your lizard brain tells you something's not right, it's not right. And I sometimes feel it when I'm walking down the street by someone. So I don't know if my if, if mine is, if I'm super paranoid or if I'm just super aware. But, or if all women feel that way. But, Jesus, there are some people that will, will make that lizard brain light up sometimes and there's got to be a reason for it it's not just you know it's something like like it's like an animalistic thing where you know there's a predator near so so something happens in your brain and I just I wish we didn't I wish we didn't force that down like when it happens we think oh I should be polite because I'm walking by this guy I should be polite or he's asking me if I have the time or if he's asking me if you know I have you know can help him find this or do that and you think oh he's just asking for help he's just another person in need like I gotta help him no you don't you don't have to help him you have to make sure you're safe and, and your kids are safe and your friends are safe and you have to make sure that uh, you don't put yourself in danger so no you don't owe anybody anything and certainly not a stranger and there are other ways for strangers to get help and there look at that I'm done I don't love that painting I'll tell you that I kind of love her smile because I think she's like I'm gonna get you because she's got that hatchet she's not gonna get her friends she's going to get a bad guy don't worry those are the paints I used there's the weird painting again whatever it's fun I like it thanks for watching bye